Chapter 3. Fear, How It Works One of the most important means of eradicating fear is knowledge of its operation. When we know how fear operates, we shall be freed from its bondage. When we know how it gets into our lives, we shall know how to keep it out and how to cope with it. The trouble with most of us is that we are not generally aware of fear until after it has us in its toils. We know that we are in trouble, but we do not recognize its source. Fear, like all other negative emotions, operates as suggestion. It works through our thoughts and beliefs. If we refuse to accept the suggestions of evil, if we refuse to believe in evil, it dies. If we accept it, it takes possession of us. The Oriental has a clever little reminder of this truth in the symbol of the three monkeys. Reading from left to right, they say, See no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. The lesson, of course, is obvious. When the Oriental pauses before the door of his temple, removes his sandals and touches his eyes, his ears, and his lips, he believes that evil drops out of his life. He is saying with Habakkuk that God is of pure eyes and to behold evil and cannot look on inequity. We like the custom very much, for it is just another way of making us conscious of the need to prevent evil suggestions from getting into the mind. We believe, however, that there should be five monkeys instead of three. To close the door of consciousness tightly, we should add two more monkeys, fear no evil and think no evil. If it is true, as science declares, that mind and not matter sees, hears, feels, and speak, we must control evil suggestion at their source. When we have learned to place the seal not only upon our eyes, lips, and ears, but upon the mind itself, we shall have entered into that peace which passes all understanding. We shall have come to that place in consciousness to which Jesus referred to when he said, The prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. What did he mean by that statement? He meant that no thought of fear, or trouble, or sickness, or limitation could enter his experience, because there was nothing in his consciousness to attract it. Evil suggestions come rushing and pressing against us, but they cannot press in on the consciousness that is positive to good, for there is nothing in that consciousness to attract or hold it. When we refuse to give evil eyes to see with lips, to speak, to ears, to hear, emotions to feel with, and the mind to think with, evil will drop out of our lives and we will find ourselves happy, whole, prosperous, and well. When evil hath nothing in us, it plays no part in our lives. We humans, with our fears, are very much like monkeys and with their traps. To capture monkeys in Africa, hunters use coconuts. First they hollow the coconuts out through a small hole on one end, and then they drop in a handful of nuts. The monkey, seeing the nuts, thrusts in his hand and grabs his fistful. He looks wonderfully pleased until he finds that his fist, clenched full of nuts, is too big to get back through the hole. Does the monkey let go of the nuts and escape the hunter? Not by a jugful. He screams and chatters, jumps up and down, rolls over, but he does not let go. The fearful person gets caught in much the same manner. In a moment of fleeing panic, he becomes afraid. Through some suggestion, he grabs hold of a fear and thrusts it down deep in his subconscious mind. It strikes him at the weakest spot, and as always the case with volatile and explosive thoughts, there is an immediate reaction in his mind and body. He shudders and shakes, but he won't let go. He refuses to face his fear and is caught in its deceitful embrace. It is a fact that animals will attack a man only when he is afraid of them. Human fear throws out a subtle effluvia with the animal smells, and this in turn arouses a corresponding fear in the animal. Consequently, he attacks for self-protection. It doesn't make any difference, you see, whether it be an animal kingdom or the human kingdom. Fear always attracts the worst. If a man is afraid of life, he will attract the worst from life. He will give the impression of timidity, incompetence, indecision, vacillation, lack of self-confidence. These impressions hurt his chances and cause others to take advantage of him. The fearless man, on the other hand, impresses his power, confidence, and self-assurance upon all those with whom he comes in contact. Now what is the difference between these two men? just a difference in attitude. The law of attraction is at work in both cases. The first man uses the law destructively, but the second man uses it constructively. The first man uses the law through an attitude of fear. The second man uses it through an attitude of faith. There is just one law, but there are many ways of using it. It responds to our attitude, states of mind, just as steel filings are attracted to a magnet. If we fear a thing, we attract it to us just as surely as if we asked for it. The mental attitude of fear acts like a magnet in attracting to us the people, things, objects, and circumstance that are in harmony with it. The reason that things we fear come upon us is that we allow negative images to form in the mind. When we desire or fear a thing, we make a mental picture of the thing that sets the law in motion. Then we think about it, brood over it, and feed it with our thoughts until finally we draw it to us. 
St. Paul said, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There is but one substance out of which everything is made. This is the universal substance through which the results of our thinking are made tangible. It is so sensitive to our thought that it is molded by it. Then why do we not use this power to mold the things we need instead of the things we do not need? Why do we waste it in fear, argument, worry, criticism, anger, and greed, when what we want is courage, peace, confidence, trust, love, and supply? Why do we fill our minds with thoughts of sickness, poverty, bitterness, murder, hate, war, robbery, and ill will, when we want health, wealth, and goodwill? Why should we not mold the pure substance of God into the things that we really desire? Fortunately, most of our fears are short-lived. They linger only for a few hours or days, and then they're gone. They are great wasters of energy and substance, to be sure. But we do not live with any of them long enough to put the law of attraction into operation. A seated fear, on the other hand, is like a two-way magnet. It not only forms and draws the things we fear toward us, but it also forces us toward the thing itself. Probably no one can prevent evil suggestion from coming to him any more than he can prevent the birds from flying over his head. But everyone can keep the suggestion of fear from taking root into his life. He can do it by changing the polarity of his faith. He can do it by learning to think what he wants and to stop thinking what he does not want. The man who is in difficulty or trouble needs to make the most of what he has. He needs a calm and balanced mind and intact faculties. If he is fearful, he incapacitates himself for doing his best, and others sense his spirit of cowardice and defeat and shun him. If he goes about with an attitude of discouragement, fear, and self-distrust, other people feel his negative qualities of mind and govern themselves accordingly. Would you like to know how to triumph over your fears? Emerson said, Do the thing, and you have the power. They who do not do the thing do not have the power. If you want to put yourself under the law of attraction instead of the law of repulsion, you must change your consciousness. You must watch your thoughts, your mental attitude, and your words all day long. Are you negative at the present time? Then start at once to think about God. Put God in the place of every negative thought as it comes along. Fill your mind with thoughts of courage, enthusiasm, self-confidence, and success. Stop judging according to appearance. If things seem particularly bad, keep repeating the words. If God be for us, who can be against us? Say them over and over again until you believe them. You will be amazed at the lightning-like speed with such circumstance and conditions will change. Instead of going out to seek opportunities, persons, and things, you will find that these will now seek you. They will come to you because of the new images in your mind and because of the law of attraction which says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Do you have an important letter to write? Then become still and say, God, think thy thoughts in my mind. What doest thou desire written? Here is my hand, use it. Pour thy wisdom through my hand. We have all heard many times that thoughts are things, and some of us may have challenged the truth of the statement. The dictionary defines thought as an idea or a concept, and the metaphysician defines it as a movement of consciousness. Thoughts are things because they have the power to objectify themselves. We know that sick and defective thoughts make sick and defective bodies, just as thoughts of God and truth bring strength and health to the body. We know that inflammatory conditions in the body are greatly aggravated by worry and by concentrating the mind upon them. We know further that it is not the smile on the face that makes a man happy, but happiness in the heart that produces a smile. If you do not believe that thoughts are things, watch the people who have vicious mental attitudes, violent tempers, and explosive passions, and compare their lives with those of the persons who have tranquil minds and joyous, uplifting thoughts and emotions, and you will never doubt again. The truth is that every thought is constantly sending a succession of vibrations to the nerves, cells, and muscles of the body, and is producing an effect exactly like its cause. Yes, thoughts are the realest of all real things. When we understand what the negative variety of thoughts does to us, we shall avoid it as we would the smallpox. Let the angry man breathe into a glass tube, and his breath will leave a brownish deposit on the glass. Scrape this off and give it to a guinea pig, and you will kill it. We do know, of course, just what mental states cause the various physical ills from which we suffer, but the mental chemist could tell us in detail. It is sufficient to know that discord in the mind produces discord in the body, and that if the body were always in harmony, the body could never be sick. A man's mind is like a great mental radio station. It is constantly sending out messages of faith or fear, good or evil, health or sickness, rich or poverty, according to the character of his thought. 
These messages are flying from us with lightning-like speed in every direction and bringing back circumstance, condition, people, and things that are identical with the mental attitude or concept that sent them out. Just as there are air currents in the atmosphere and ocean currents in the seas, there are thought currents in the mental realm. There are thought currents of fear and faith. There are thought currents of success and of failure. Thought currents of prosperity and of depression. Thought currents of peace and of discord. Each thought is tuned to a certain wavelength according to the intensity of one's belief, and each radiates from the thinker to immeasurable distances. We shall think of mind, then, as a great magnetic field in which our thought operates. We shall think of our attitudes and concepts as push-buttons that ring bells in the soul and tune us into the circumstance and conditions like our thoughts. The same ether that brings us jazz and swing music also brings us the great classic and symphonies, depending upon the button we push. The success station puts us in touch with the success currents of the world, just as the failure station puts us in touch with the failure currents. But the station we tune into brings us the people, conditions, and things that correspond exactly with the state of mind creating that wavelength. If we persist in living and thinking on a negative side of life, we shall have not only our own destructive thoughts to contend with, but the destructive thoughts of the entire world. That is what people mean when they say such things as, it never rains but it pours. Trouble never comes singly. I'm in a vicious circle. If we think and talk defeat, we shall be burdened in our belief by the millions of other defeatist thoughts that are circulating in the ethers. What is worse, we shall attract people and events that correspond to our own state of mind. Most people, when they are ill or in trouble, want everyone to know it. They believe that misery loves company, and they get a vague sort of satisfaction out of the syndicating their miseries and publicizing their ills. When will people learn that it is easier to heal one thought of sickness their own than it is the thought of many people as know about their illness? When will they learn that the fewer people who know about their illness and troubles, the sooner they will be healed? Jesus said, Abide in me. The Bible said, Cast your bread, or thought, upon the waters, ether, for thou shalt find it after many days. Thoughts return to us with increased power. What we send out returns to us with clock-like regularity. Regardless of the thought used, the thinker himself feels the effect of it. If we use a thought loaded with hate or bitterness, it will return to us in time to explode in our own backyard. If we use a thought of blessing, it will return to bless us. Our thoughts have the power to make us or break us. Positive and constructive thoughts are like good food. They give nourishment and strength to the mind and body. Negative and destructive thoughts are like poison. They devitalize the mind and weaken the body. Thoughts may be weights or wings. They can bind us or set us free. They can peg us down or lift us up. They can put trouble into our life or take trouble away. Like the push button, every thought rings the bell somewhere in the great universal mind. Whether friend or enemy responds depending on the nature of the thought. It would, of course, be interesting to watch the evolution of a thought from the time of its conception right through to its materialization. But at present we can only imagine what goes on in the mind when we think. As far as we know, the thinking process is very similar to what happens when we throw a stone into the center of a pond. Conscious thinking, we say, takes place in the center of consciousness and moves out from center to circumference, exerting an effect upon everything within its field of influence. Let us think of our consciousness as a pond, and let us imagine that we have just thrown a stone into its center, the stone, of course, symbolizing the thought or impulse which is being sent out. What happens? There is an immediate release of energy by the impact of the stone or thought upon the water, and the energy spreads from the point of contact in the form of waves, each wave making an ever-widening circle. Did the water move when we threw the stone into the pond? No, it had the appearance of moving, but the water itself did not move. All energy travels as wave, expanding in circles from the center where the energy originated. Light, Dr. Southard says, consists of waves in ether, while sound consists of waves in the air, but both travel in the same way. The radio waves that are bringing you entertainment at this moment are waves in the ether traveling with the speed of light from the broadcasting station. Wherever waves of energy are found, there is somewhere a center of activity from which they radiate. It may be a powerful radio station, the sun, or a pebble striking the water. Our chief concern at the moment is not with light waves, heat waves, or sound waves, but with mental waves. There is evidence now that man's mind is constantly sending out through his thought waves of energy that initiate certain activities and cause definite results. Thoughts are things. Thoughts are creative. They work in accordance with their nature. If you do not like the results of your thinking, do not blame the thoughts, but blame your choice of thought. 
When you choose better thoughts, they will do better work. When you send out thoughts that are in accordance with your desire, they will accomplish the things you want done. But whether you get what you want or what you do not want, it is always your thoughts that determine the results. Thoughts make the crooked places straight or make straight roads crooked. They spoil your plans or carry them out. If your thought is negative when you have an important job to do, it will produce discord, chaos, and failure. If it is positive, your thought will produce harmony, order, and success. But it is always your thought about the work that supports you and not the actual work that you do. There is a vast difference, you see, between being a servant of a thought and having a thought for a servant. Since you choose your thoughts and give them life through your consciousness, you also have the privilege of choosing the ones fitted to do the work you want done. But stop a moment and consider the thoughts you are thinking right now. What kind of thoughts were you thinking before you picked up this book? Are they the kind of thoughts that are going to prepare the way for things you want done? Or are they going to hinder you? Has it occurred to you that the thoughts you are thinking right now may be preparing success or failure, health or sickness for you in weeks, months, or years ahead? Has it occurred to you that the thoughts you are sending out today will have a tremendous influence on the circumstance and conditions you will meet tomorrow? Let us suppose that you have a weighty problem to be solved. If you are afraid of your ability to solve it, if you are worrying about it, you are sending forth fear thoughts to mess it up. You are complicating what otherwise might have been a very simple matter. By doubting your own ability to solve the problem, you are obscuring the solution. The practical way to solve a problem of any kind is first to turn away from it, remembering Jesus' command, Get thee behind me. Second, to send forth thoughts of faith, self-assurance, and self-confidence. You must know that you are God-controlled and that your thoughts of faith and confidence have right of way over everything else. You must know that nothing can prevent their accomplishing what you send them out to do. If I charge my word or thoughts with interest and power, as I would charge an electric battery with electricity, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that whereto I sent it. What is the most important thing in overcoming discord or trouble? What is the determining factor in success or failure? There can be but one answer, the mental preparation, the change in consciousness. It is just as though you have been trying for a long time to do something alone and after many failures had decided to call for help. What does the Father say when you call upon Him? Just this, step aside, get out of the way. Jesus showed that He understood this perfectly. He said, I must be about my Father's business. He meant that God was working through His consciousness and that He must not erect obstacles to His good by negative or double-minded thinking. He knew that He should be an open channel through which the divine power could operate. If you have a pencil near at hand, underscore that last sentence and remember that it applies to you. Remember that you are a center of divine activity just as Jesus was, and God can do for you only what he can do through you. In such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Remember also that he can do nothing for you until you have synchronized your thought with your desire. The Father's business is always the best that you can conceive for yourself or for others. It is always beneficial, constructive, and upbuilding. If you are sending out thoughts of this character, you are about the Father's business and are attracting good into your life. But if you are sending out destructive thoughts, you are a center of destructive energy. You are about the devil's business instead of the father's, and the devil, the divided mind, always brings the worst instead of the best. Choose you this day whom you will serve, God or mammon, fear or faith. If you go out on the icy pavement fearing you will fall, your fear increases your danger of falling many times. If you fear the outcome of an undertaking or business deal, your fear increases the possibility of failure. If you fear an accident on the highway in your car, your fear prepares the place for the accident long before you reach the spot. But if you have confidence in the thing you want to do and know that God is doing it and not you, you will travel every road, meet every emergency, and face every problem with speed, safety, and success. If you are in a bottleneck and do not know just what to do or where what way to go, say with deep conviction, Infinite wisdom now reveals to me the way I should go. If your way seems blocked and hazardous, then send this thought. The Spirit of the Lord goes before me and makes easy and successful my way. Always put the problem in God's hand first, knowing that it will be taken care of. Let go of it. Change your thought from personality problem to God and rejoice that the problem is being solved. See His power radiating from you in great waves of constructive energy, destroying everything that is evil in your life and establishing only those things which are good. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you on this day. 
If you ever tried to stand still in the face of danger, you know what a difficult thing it is to do. The children of Israel were on the run, fleeing from the wrath of Pharaoh, when suddenly Moses told them to stop running and to stand still. It is hard to imagine any more inappropriate time to have told the children of Israel to stand still. When the material sense that is no way out, when every way seems closed except up, there is just one thing to do, and that is to stand still, and fix the vision steadily upon God. Stand still and see. There is real vision in that command, for it means that fear will be conquered by the complete realization of God's presence and power in the present moment. When the human mind sees no way through or around some difficulty, be still and know. Stand still and see. Change your consciousness from self to God, and a way of escape will be provided. A door will be opened, and the problem will be solved. One of the real secrets in overcoming fear is the ability to live in the present and to have no thought about any other time or condition. It is a tragedy that old people tend to live in the past and that young people tend to live in the future. Both miss the happiness and power of living in the present. Now ask yourself if there ever has been a serious problem or an unpleasant situation in your life that you have not survived. Of course there hasn't or you wouldn't be here to tell it. Then why not accept the experience of the past as a guarantee for the future? Why not accept the fact that since God is always present and is always giving his best, there will never be any need that will not be met? What does the Bible say? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. It is not the problem, losses, and reverses of today that tear you down, but those you fear may come at some future time. Everyone is able to meet the problems of today, but when he piles on the problems of tomorrow, next week, or next month, he is literally breaking his own mental neck. One of the most important things in controlling fear is to control the imagination, to refuse to let it visualize anything unpleasant or negative in the future. God gives us strength for each day's work, but if we dissipate that strength in combating imaginary troubles, we go down in defeat. The wise man does not waste his power on the imaginary troubles of the future. He uses today's energy for today's needs. He so fortifies himself by living in the present that when disappointed, reverses and losses come to him, he can say with St. Paul, None of these things move me. Now we come to the most important factor in controlling fear, the ability to keep the mind on God and off self. Jesus stressed this point in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be evil or divided, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. He is speaking, of course, of the imagining faculty of the mind. In the conscious mind we have the power to select or reject thought. But the subconscious or creative mind accepts and acts upon the ideas we give it. It has no power of choice. If the conscious mind chooses only good thoughts, the whole man will be full of light. If that mind selects fear, superstition, gloom, despair, and anxiety to dwell upon, the whole man will be full of darkness. The imperative thing in getting fear and other evil forces out of our lives is to change the subconscious thought pattern. We do that in a way that the chemist destroys the corrosive power of an acid, that is, by substituting its opposite, an alkali. St. Paul said, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with God. In other words, neutralize the fear thought by substituting its natural antidote, the courage thought. If you are filled with fear, reverse the fear pattern by filling yourself with faith. Faith always overcomes fear, just as alkali overcomes an acid. It is a lamentable thing that so many people go through life burdened with fear when they only need to free them from this boogie is a simple change of thought. The reason fear seems so hard to overcome is that we do so little about it. We continue to see the thing we fear through the human mind, through the glass darkly, and it always appears larger and more formidable than it really is. It frightens us because we allow it to remain vague and shadowy. The time to meet fear is now, and the way to meet it is to bring it out into the light. When we change our thoughts about it, it will disappear before our eyes. Did you ever analyze your fear? Well, do so right now. Ask yourself what fear is and whence comes its power to paralyze you, to strangle you, and to make you weak. Manifesting fear is a mental picture, an attitude of the mind. It has absolutely no reality or power except that which you give it in your thought. Fear is neither person, place, nor thing. We cannot see it, touch it, taste it, nor smell it. It is purely a figment of the imagination. The moment we realize this, the moment does it cease to have power over us. The great defense against fear is stated in St. John's words. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
To know this truth, to realize that nothing in the outer has any power to harm us except through our thoughts, is to be free from fear. Would you be mightier than the circumstance in your life? Then start right now to apply the alkalis to the acid. Take each negative thought operated in your life and neutralize it by substituting its opposite. If you feel fearful today, destroy the pattern of fear by affirming faith. Keep affirming it until the positive thought reaction takes its place. Hold to the new image until it forms in you a consciousness of itself. Clear your thought of everything that obstructs your belief in the power and goodness of God. The writer of Proverbs said, Keep thy heart or subconscious mind with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of it, God answers your prayer and supplies your needs out of it. Good or ill comes according to the images in your mind. Keep it tuned to the best, and the best will come back to you. But if thy eye be evil, full of doubt, fear, worry, and anxiety, the whole body shall be full of darkness. It will be full of darkness because you have pushed dark thoughts down into the subconscious mind, and out of the heart or subconscious mind are the issues of life. Since all fears rest upon some uncertainty concerning the personal self, the most fearless man is the one who is the most selfless. Jesus said, Deny thyself. And St. Paul said, Put off the old man and put on the new man, which is Christ. These are hard sayings, and like Nicodemus, many of us will not obey. We want to be saved in our sins and not from them. We are willing to change everybody else, but we are not willing to change ourselves. We are perfectly willing to have two selves instead of one. We are perfectly willing to have two minds instead of one. Now listen to the scriptures again. Except ye be converted, ye shall in no wise enter the kingdom. We hear much in the church these days about conversions, but very few really understand what it means. To be truly converted means to change allegiance or to change identity. It means not only a change of mind, but a change of self. It is not acquiring a new consciousness, but changing the one we have. It is shifting the center of gravity from the human to the divine in a determined effort to get the lower man cooperating with the higher man. When you are really converted, you simply ally yourself with the truth of your being and make it dominant. You choose the right and boldly declare yourself on that side. You think on that side, live on that side, and work on that side. If ye know these things, said Jesus, happy are ye if you do them. But maybe you do not know how to put off the old man. Maybe you do not know how to deny the self. Then listen to Jesus again. Leave all and follow me. Leave all the preconceived ideas, opinions, habits of thought, and personal reactions to whatever may be happening in the world. Leave all sense of personal responsibility, care, and anxiety. Give up your tendency to worry, fret, and strain. Surrender your doubts, quandaries, problems, haste, and pressure. Leave all your hardships, disappointment, perplexities, and uncertainties. Let go of your personal prejudice and antagonisms. Give up all your feeling of defeat, failure, futility, frustration, and despair. Surrender your negative emotions, your grudges, and your grievances. Stop thinking about your body, your symptoms, your weakness, your disabilities, and your pain. Stop thinking what is wrong with you and what is going wrong with the world and start thinking about God. Put Him in all the vacant places of your life. Forget all the bitter resentments, jealousies, and hatreds of the lower man. Drop all destructive criticism, cynicism, and skepticism. When you have put off everything that is inimical to God, you will have put on the Christ. Do you ever wonder why it is that one day you are at the top of your world, cheery, optimistic, and happy, pleased with everybody and everything in the next day? With no change whatever in your outer circumstance, you are down in the dumps, pessimistic, worried, fearful, and filled with strange foreboding. The answer lies in the fact that the lower man is not keeping up with the higher man. There are two ways of looking at life because there are two selves in every man. There is the human or personal self that judges according to appearance in the standards of the world. There is the Christ, spiritual self, that judges according to the principle of truth and the standards of God. One sees the dark side of things, the other sees the bright side. One is pessimistic, the other is optimistic. One hears the voice of evil, the other hears the voice of God. One makes the worst of life, the other makes the best of life. One attracts poverty, the other attracts prosperity. We must harmonize these two selves before we can manifest our perfect state on earth. Harmony can be achieved only by keeping the higher self in the saddle at all times. We must practice the presence of God in every thought, word, and deed, and we must throw the whole weight of the mind on the higher force of our being. We must never let the lower self raise his head for a second. Since life, people, circumstance, and conditions will always be to you what you are to them, 
Keep the higher self uppermost. Ensures harmony outside as well as within. Your sense of pessimism will always be in proportion to your sense of inharmony. The world will always be to you what you are to it. It will always react to you according to your attitude toward it. The antidote for pessimism was given to us by St. Paul. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, put your mind in order, and order will prevail in your world. Your world will right itself. But let your thoughts run wild. Let your imagination conjure fear. Let the lower man have right of way, and the world will seem dark and topsy-turvy. In the world, or lower man, said Jesus, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Would you like to overcome your world as Jesus did? Then identify yourself with God. Form new images of yourself. Stay your mind upon them. Think about them. Pray about them. Very soon you will begin to live them. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee.